Um, my name is Amara Gilcrest. I'm the chief of Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services. Um, I've been the chief now for about five months. Um, I've worked for the city for 24. I'm actually in my 25th year um, with the city of Pittsburgh. I started here as an EMT and then I got promoted to a paramedic and then a crew chief. Um, I worked in those roles for approximately 13 years until I entered um, management, which was at a mid-level management position. Um, I, I became a district chief. Um, just a fun fact, <laughs> um, I was the, was the first African-American female district chief for our department. And then I subsequently got promoted um, to assistant chief same thing, first African-American female, actually first uh, African-American female, but female. Um, and then I became the deputy chief, which, um, you know, I broke two ceilings there, was the first African-American and the first female. And now same thing uh, with my current position as chief of the bureau. actually went, put myself through EMT school. And fun, look, here's a fun fact. Talk about um, barriers. So um, I was a single mom when I had started with the city, um, but I, uh, I grew up in the city. I graduated from Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, and fast forward to my life, you know, just the mundane in uh, just day in, day out. And I, I wanted to become an EMT. So I went to EMT school and I actually went through paramedic school. Barriers, here's barriers. So I remember uh, discussing this with my dad and I'm just like, I don't have the money to go to paramedic school. And at that time, about 26 or something years ago, <laughs> um, it was only $190. But $190 was a lot of money for a single mom. And my dad gave me the money and I went through paramedic school. And while I was in finishing up paramedic school, I was doing a clinical rotation at one of our local emergency rooms. And I had met a Pittsburgh paramedic and I asked him, I said, how can I get a job where you're at? And he actually gave me John Moon's contact information. And I subsequently, the next day, because I, I remember this because I was really tired because I was working the clinical rotation at night and I would work my full-time job during the day. And I ended up calling him the next day. And um, he said, yeah, come in and meet with me. And I came in and met with him and the rest was pretty much history. <laughs> So the, the, the changes that I have seen as of late is there has been a seismic shift in the demographic makeup of our department as far as the um, generations. We're like in the middle of like three generations. You have like the baby boomers, the Gen Xs, and then you have the millennials, and I forget who comes after them. So we, we it's, it's unique in the fact that we have so many generations working right now, which is a challenge in itself because you have to be able to cater to each generation. You have to be able to understand um, their mindset, how they work, their experiences, and sort of mesh it all together. Um, I do find it's challenging at times, but um, because I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm in the middle of the baby boomers, <laughs> millennials, um, I sort of can see both sides. Um, some of the other things that have changed is that I'm probably, uh, unless something bad happens, which hopefully it does not, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm pretty young. So it's, I, I, our last, I'll say three to four chiefs that were here stayed in this role to, for approximately three to four years, and then they retired. So I don't know if their plight so much was to change the trajectory of the department as much as it was um, just to keep the boat sailing and just to make sure everything um, was taken care of, make sure the crews were taken care of, and not really um, 
in the position or wanting to push new initiatives just because I, a status is always comfortable and I'm uncomfortable with being comfortable. So um, I want to push and, and I'm trying to push some new objectives and uh, agendas to bring our department into um, 21st century. EMS has by and large been a bureau that no one really knows a lot about. Um, so I'm trying to get that word out there, uh, not only to the city, but also to the city residents. Um, so in that, uh, we have, uh, we're going to start an apprenticeship program. That's something that we've never done before. Um, we're going to try to start in, in a house EMT academy um, to uh, oyster or uh, recruitment uh, and retention. Um, we're, we're really trying to hit social media very hard um, to uh, obtain applicants, but also just for the general public to see what EMS does. I've always said that no one knows what EMS does unless you need to call 911. And um, so we're, we're not just ambulance drivers. We're actually a mobile emergency room. Um, and that, that just needs to be conveyed to the public um, as well as not only do we do medical treatment, but we have medically directed rescue. We're in charge of all of the rescues in the city. I mean, building collapses, car accidents, people over hillsides. Um, we have a motorcycle uh, division which, you know, they're very helpful uh, when it comes to like parades and they can get in and out of crowds and they actually have medical equipment. And they can treat people. Um, we have our tactical medics. We have our river rescue. So our service is so multifaceted. Um, so that needs to be conveyed to the public. And that's one of the my biggest uh, plights. One of my proudest moments, and it this might sound like really um, minuscule, but um, <clears throat> my daughter, she goes to school up the street, and from time to time, she um, whenever she gets off, she comes down, and she'll sit here and she'll do her homework. And I was having a very um, serious conversation on the telephone. It wasn't anything confidential or anything, but she had never seen me in my element. And my daughter right now is 16 um, and she's sitting across the room from me and she's actually looking stargazed and she's sitting there and she's looking at me like this. And after I got off the phone, I said, why are you looking at me like that? She goes, mom, I'm so proud of you. And that was, that's probably out of everything else, um, probably one of the defining moments of when I realized what this position means, because I have not had time to sit back and say, wow, I'm the chief, because there's so many things that need to get done. Um, I feel like I'm blessed to be in this position. It's an honor to be in this position. I don't take it lightly. Therefore, I'm going to keep working and pushing and just getting the most done that I can. So it's kind of hard to sit back and say, oh, I'm so proud of myself. But it's just that that one little moment when she did that, that made me say, wow, I am the chief, you know, but other than that, look, I'm a servant of the public. I'm a servant to the personnel that work here. Um, so I, I, it, it's not it doesn't make my head swell. I'll say that, you know, because my duty is to this bureau. It's to the Department of Public Safety. It's to the mayor. It's to the citizens. So. When I first um, came to uh, 
and was introduced to John Moon, he told me all about it. And subsequently, over the years, I have gained a better understanding of the challenges and the difficulties they faced actually establishing one of the first EMS services in the nation. Um, I, uh, as far as when I first started here, I didn't look at the importance of the um, the beginning till now. Um, because when I first started with the city, I just wanted to make money. I just wanted to take care of my family. So I wasn't thinking about the bigger picture. It's not until I got into management and I seen how there's not a lot of women. There are not a lot of African-Americans. Um, some of the comments that I'll receive. Um, so I, I think at that point is when I really started to realize the significance of Freedom House and what the men and the women who were here before me, the struggles that they had to go through to get me to where I'm at now and to some of the old Freedom House members, particularly John Moon, and when he sees me and he smiles and he goes, you know, I've, I've faced a lot of challenges. And he, he, he said, none of that was in vain because you're at where you're at. The, the Freedom House book that came out, American Sirens, um, and I'm still actually reading it because my time, it just seems like it's so minuscule. So it's like when I get to pick it up and read excerpts from the book, it's just like, holy cow, like um, Peter Safford, the one who started like Freedom House and all of that. I mean, he like developed CPR. He would actually stop people's respirations and paralyze them and then breathe for them. And these were clinical trials. I mean, you can never get away with anything like that now. That's like crazy. But him being able to do that, that is how CPR was developed. Um, there are so many things. Pittsburgh is rich with medical knowledge. I mean, we have so many hospitals and it was just like, it's almost 360 full circle that this is the birthplace of EMS because of the medical advances that have occurred here in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, as far as, and, and I know um, uh, Mr. Moon loves to, to uh, toot his horn about being the first person to ever do a field innovation. Um, that is phenomenal in itself because I've innovated people and it is terrifying because you're you're putting a tube down somebody's throat who is unconscious. And if you don't put it in the right place, <laughs> you could cause more harm. So that's like, I mean, I can't imagine being in his position where that had never been done before. And he's the first person to do it and was successful at it. Um, we have made so many leaps and bounds since then, um, like this year, 2023. Um, we actually started giving um, blood transfusions in the field. That's huge. That is huge. We've never done that before. Pittsburgh EMS hopefully will actually start carrying blood um, uh, products um, to help people that are uh, injured severely that need transfusions in the field. Right now, the way that we get um, blood products or, uh, you know, if we have like a significant accident or somebody that's um, shot where they're like losing blood or trapped under a piece of equipment, um, we'll actually call the hospital and uh, one of our supervisors will go get blood and report to the scene. So there, that's just one small thing. I mean, we, we, we are now giving people medications in the field who are addicted to opioids that now you can reverse the uh, effects of an overdose, but you can also give them medication where they won't go into withdrawal. And hopefully um, with the fact that we can do that, get them into treatment. Um, so 
I always, when I, when I talk to students, I always say 90% of being a paramedic or an EMT is being a social worker, um, talking to people in their darkest times and you are their light. Um, somebody that's sick. I've walked into many houses and I've had someone writhing on the floor in pain. And it's just, I'm like, wow, like he just broke his toe. But guess what? His his emergency may not be my urgency, but it's his emergency. And I'm there to help him. It doesn't matter. You know, and it's sometimes people just need to hear it's going to be OK. And then, you know, then you treat them. You give them medications to take the pain away. You stabilize their injury. So those are all the things that being a paramedic or an EMT, you know, they encompass not only just your medical training, but just being able to talk to people, a friendly face when someone needs just somebody to be there. Because of the, the, the history of Freedom House is so rich, and I know that Lately, Freedom House has been mentioned a lot, like in the media, books have come out, documentaries, all of that. There's still some people that are not educated as to what Freedom House was and the impact that they made on modern pre-hospital care. So anybody that comes into our bureau, like as a new hire, they need to sit and watch the documentary and that's going to become part of their training when they come here because you never know where you're going unless you know where you came from. So just knowing that, wow, you know, I'm actually a part of history. Anybody that comes in this bureau is a part of history, no matter their gender, their race, their ethnicity, whatever. They're part of history because this is the birthplace of EMS. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing, um, like I said, is the apprenticeship program and an EMT program to, to just get people into this field. Nationwide EMS is suffering uh, shortages with EMTs and paramedics. Um, some people think it's a dying career path, but it's not. Um, I think there's some advances that need to be made. Um, the one thing that the city has implemented was the Office of uh, Community Health and Safety, which that is going to be a huge, huge um, uh, uh, asset um, because a lot of people who call 911, a lot of times they don't really need 911. A lot of times there's social issues. Um, people who have never gone to the hospital, their first um, interaction with a doctor or any kind of medical personnel is from calling 911, um, where if they were getting checkups and having preventative um, screenings, it wouldn't be an emergency. So um, OCHS is trying to do a lot to mitigate that, which actually, because our bureau runs approximately 65,000 calls a year. And there's only 200 medical personnel. So you can imagine that workload um, taking some of that away and directing people to the resources that they actually need and not calling 911 um, for just routine things that can be handled at an urgent care or just getting them the res getting getting them to the resources that they need. Um, it's going to be huge. So all of those things, um, as far as the EMTs and the paramedics and pre-hospital care, I think as um, decades go on, we will find even better ways to serve the community and the public and to try to mitigate some of the illnesses and injuries that people suffer by education.